and uh, Brendan, if you can put that on, that's Proverbs uh, 9 10. Proverbs 9 10. So that's the actual title of the message, and on that theme I will base my message. Yeah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word is a living word that is sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even soul and spirit. It separates the marrow from the bone. It goes to deep our inner being. It's a living word. And I pray, Father God, that the word this morning will be living and active in our hearts and our minds, that it will uplift us, that it will strengthen us, that it will correct us, rebuke us, strengthen us, guide us in all truth. In Jesus' name. Yes, in Jesus' name. The fear of the Lord. Yeah, fear. So... Pastor, a few months ago, or not that long ago, you preached a message on fear not, so are you contradicting yourself? So here's the limitation in the English language, of course, that for that word fear, which has a different root word in the original scriptures, is translated both as fear. So there's, there's definitely more than 365 scriptures, so one for every day, where the Lord says fear not. Yeah. So that's obviously uh, of something of not being afraid. Uh, not being terrified, and uh, that is definitely a word we need these days. Um, you know, where are we going? And with with this whole COVID thing, because it's the, the cure is worse than the, than the actual virus. And we'll come to that. Maybe we'll touch on that in a few things as well. But um, also, we see that intelligent people can lack wisdom. Yes. I mean, yeah. I remember. I mean, um, growing up. In, in, uh, going to a secular high school uh, in Europe. I mean, evolution is ba basically, you're basically brainwashed with evolution. So I was thinking, how is it possible that intelligent people can just hold on to a theory that's so wonky? <laughs> yeah? I mean, if you've noticed, scientists don't talk about Darwin anymore. That's how science deal with these things, is if it's disproven, just don't talk about it anymore. Yeah? But the conclusion is, if we come to intelligent design, then we come to the terrible conclusion that there must be a higher be being. Yes. So, <laughs> um, science can't deal with that. So we're, we're talking here not about unintelligent people, highly intelligent people, and yet people can lack wisdom. And we're seeing this also in the measures that are being uh, implemented these days is that there are so many medical doctors saying the masks don't work, they don't. So, you know, what is it with people that they, they are acting out of fear and not investigating the proper scientific facts, but that might change. So, anyway, the, the topic is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so, coming back to that, what does fear in the original word really, really means? It means like a respect, yes. standing in awe, mm -hmm. in reverence for God. And I have one concern, well, there's a few concerns, for a younger generation growing up in contemporary churches today. And, you know, the type of church I grew up in, um, in a very traditional Dutch Reformed church, and you walk in and the organ is playing, and so if you dare to sneeze, cough, move, you got a <laughs> whack from somebody else behind you, which was... Of course, politically incorrect today, but that's what they did in society. That community disciplined and corrected you. Yeah, it was not just your parents. Um, and it's, I'm not saying it's ideal, but one thing I, I would say that it installed in me is this a holy as a little child going to this big uh, church and organ playing and everybody sitting now still. I'm not mocking it in any form or way, but what it did do is install a, a, like a, a deep respect. There must be a creator, a, a God. They had the Ten Commandments on the back next to the pulpit, five on this side and five on that side, and they read it every morning, so you certainly knew what to do, what not to do. And So it's a little bit legalistic, but one thing is that it's still in, in us or on that generation a deep respect for God, a deep like and standing in awe for God and it is not a contradiction that our God is a loving heavenly father and that he cares for widows and orphans and yet at the same time is that we see of course the prophet Daniel 
and also Moses, who not just the leader of the Israelites, but also a prophet in a sense, and, and the Apostle John, all people who walk extremely closely to the Lord, and then John is probably the best example, who laid his head on, rested his head on Jesus' chest, and um, he's also the one who got the revelation. He's also the one who was at the cross, actually. All you know, the other disciples, apostles, ran away. And then he gets the revelation of the Lord God. Actually, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah? And he just faints. He falls flat on his face. The same as with prophet Daniel. Like He's like, oh, he just couldn't even stand. He needed an angelic help to get him back up. <laughs> you know? And so, these are examples that, yes, he is a, a, a loving, heavenly father. And at the same time, and it's also got a little bit to do with society. And we, we get this into the church world that I have to say, Jesus is not your mate, he's not your buddy, he's not your Facebook buddy, he is a holy yes. God. Yes. yes, he died for us, but I'm just horrified online some of the things that they call, what Christians call the Lord Jesus, uh, on, in online sites and all that, because it really comes through that they, it, they think he is his buddy, and... Um, just if they have a little need, they can just put that little coin in and that, you know, they will be supplied to. The generation is not to blame as such. It's a, it's a whole system where society has changed. You know, teachers are not allowed to correct anymore at school. I didn't dare to come home and told me um, the teacher disciplined me. I got another whack. <laughs> you probably, you'd probably deserved it. Now the parents go to the school, teacher, don't discipline my child, my discipline my angel. <laughs> it's like seriously. So it's it's not that anybody our generation isn't particularly to blame. It's just a continuous change of society and, and being permissible and. Yeah. Not correct, and a little bit we see the result of that in the church world and how Christians in general, so young and old, view our Lord and Savior. Yeah. This may I say to you when the, the Apostle Paul met the Lord Jesus in his glorified body on the way to Damascus, the light was said was brighter than the Middle East noonday sun, which is obviously extremely bright. bright. And so um, he was blinded. And the others, they didn't sort of know what was going on, but they all fell also flat on their face. And I'm just giving these examples that when we meet the Lord Jesus, He's not just our body. He is, he is the judge of the future. He's not just our Savior. He, do you know He's also a warrior? Yeah. yeah. He, he's going to defeat the nations, and it doesn't take Him very long either. It's not like Satan is even a good opponent for him. It's like it's all over in a matter of milliseconds. Yeah. yeah. And so we need to see the Lord Jesus Christ in a different light. Yes, he walked here on the earth as in a body with us. And that is God Almighty limiting himself in a human body. So that's why he couldn't walk through walls after his crucifixion and resurrection. He could walk through walls. He could fast travel. He didn't need planes, praise God. Um, so... He could do air travel, he could appear anywhere time in his glorified body. We can do the same when we have glorified bodies after the rapture, and when we meet the Lord in the sky, but not in the same manner as he has. And so I'm trying, I, I guess in words we can never fully express the holiness of God. When the angels stand before God Almighty in the book of Revelation, they cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy. And it's not that they have a lack of words in angelic language, or they have a speech impediment, but that they see God the way He is, and that's all they can say is holy. And then one of the other things that's described in the book of Revelation is a silence. There's a, there's a silence, like there's, there's an awe. And... Sometimes husbands can be silent and awestruck as well. But I'm talking here about a, a far deeper heavenly revelation that is like, wow. And can I ever express that in words? Fully no. But my concern is that the contemporary style of worship and preaching today is presenting a God who is your buddy, 
He's a, like a little slot machine. You put a little coin in it. He's the heavenly center. He is not. He is more concerned with your holiness than with your comfort. May I comfort you with that this morning? <laughs> he is more concerned with your holiness than with your comfort. Haven't you ever prayed, How long, O oh Lord, yes. do I need to wait for this? How long, O oh Lord, do I need to wait for to see fruit in my life? Well, that's going to be cultivated through suffering, through difficulties, through hardships. You cannot learn fruit in the Holy Spirit in a Bible school. Yep. Actually, living in a, in a dormitory but a Bible school can bring the worst out of you. <laughs> yeah. So it's, he's not going to... It's, it's a cultivation. Fruit only comes through snipping and pruning. And then the Lord, stop, stop, Lord. No more pruning, please. But the orchardist knows that fruit is only going to come, its blossom is only going to come in spring and fruit in the summer and harvest in, in autumn when there is, those trees are properly pruned back. Look at these orchards in the winter. Is any, is there any kiwi fruit or any apples or anything else going to grow on that? Yes, because it had to be clipped back. Yeah. If you feel clipped back this morning, praise God. If you feel pruned, praise God. Because it's all in the preparation to meet a holy God. Are you ready to meet a holy God? Are you ready to stand before His presence? I hope I am. I'm just much preaching at myself as in the audience. Am I ready? Am I ready to stand before God Almighty? Now, praise God. That's the other thing of uh, realizing uh, the holy fear of God is that there is absolutely no merit in myself or in you that enables me to stand before God Almighty. It is only and then only the blood of Jesus, like the blood on the doorposts in the houses of Egypt, only the blood of Jesus that enables us to even come before His throne. Because we see examples in the Old Testament, and we might think it's very harsh, where one man was trying to help uh, assist the ark from falling off the cart, being brought back to Israel, and he was instantly struck dead. And we think, as New Testament Christians, how harsh. You have to understand, it's not that God is harsh. Sinful flesh cannot touch holiness. The ark was a representation of the body of Christ, today and Christ the Holy Spirit on the earth it's all a representation of that it's a separate message in itself and one person was trying to touch the ark and stabilize the ark I forgot his name but it's not that important but he was he was struck death immediately because holiness and human beings the flesh sinful flesh cannot touch cannot meet and that's the problem with most occasions where you share the gospel which is actually means good news they were telling to people that they're so sinful, and this good news, that they can't come before God. And the most usual argument is that you will always hear, but I'm a good person. I pay my taxes, well, mostly pay my taxes, and I, you know, I help other people, and I do this, and I'm kind to people, and yeah, that's all recommendable, but you know, the question is, did you never lie? Did you never sin? Did you never look lustful or, or did you never? That's impossible. It is, and we are born with it. Yeah. Some parents who only um, read parenting books and they didn't take advice from parents or grandparents think that their babies are little angels. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. They are born with sin. Yeah. And if you don't put them, if the, their nappy is changed and they have milk and they keep crying, put them back in bed, shut the door and walk away. Yes. That's good parenting advice. But with their small body and their loud vocals, they can control the whole household. And that manipulation is already there from young. So don't read parenting books. Forget Dr. Spock. Just, just uh, listen to the advice of people who have done it and have been through the hard years. Anyway, it's nothing to do with the message. But it has to do with sinful nature that's there from the beginning in human beings and that's what we are dealing with is the fear of the Lord. We're also giving an example which is based on a testimony from John Bevere and I trust that in this source that he went to visit uh, Jimmy Baker 
uh, who was a well-known evangelist, gifted man, it's amazing how sin and gifting can still coexist, gifted man, uh, well-known TV evangelist in America in the 90, from the 1970s 90, and late up to the late, late 1980s, and he was caught uh, committing uh, adultery with a prostitute, and he was caught on tax fraud. Ended up in prison, and John Bevere went to visit him in, in prison, and uh, he said, Jimmy, when did you stop loving the Lord? And Jimmy Baker looked at John Bevere and he said, I never stopped loving the Lord. I never feared the Lord. And being put in prison was the best thing that ever happened to, my, to me in my life. Because I have time to reflect and to repent of my sins. But he said, I never stopped loving the Lord. I never feared the Lord. See, it is the love of God that's in Romans 2, the love of God that draws us near to Him and brings us to repentance. But it's the fear of God that keeps us on the straight and narrow. Yes. And I, I fear God. And that's the meaning of that is in its original language, not as in fearing that I'm afraid of my Heavenly Father. <coughs> But I stand in awe of God. What He has done, what He can do, and what He will do. Yeah. I stand in awe of His creation. That's why I'm, I cannot understand how intelligent beings trying to cling on to a wonky evolution theory. <laughs> they even call themselves a theory. That's because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I just want to give two examples here um, from the Old and from the New Testament and I'll read also two scriptures, just two scriptures to back this up. If you can put that on Brendan. The first one, I think I have it on the computer, Psalm uh, 89 verse 7. I'll read it, I'm not sure we have it on the opposite here. Yeah. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. Yep, by all those around him. And there's one more scripture I read in regards to this. That's in Leviticus 10 verse 3. As part of that scripture. And by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Oh, Pastor, this is Old Testament. <laughs> yeah, I'll come to that in a minute. There's two examples I want to give here. The two sons of uh, Aaron, the high priest Aaron, uh, they were uh, sacrificing something in their censers, in their big bowls, and it was called also uh, unauthorized fire. Unauthorized fire. So the Lord gave all these real detailed regulations how to worship and how to sacrifice. And they were only starting out in their ministry, and they thought, oh, you know, we can do this ourselves. So they just put something in there that was not prescribed. That's why it's called in most translations and some translations unauthorized fire. And um, they, they were struck death before the Lord during worship. Oh, great worship service. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because it's not something the Lord commanded. And the Lord was, and the tabernacle, which is also now, of course, represented, the church is a representation of that. The tabernacle was a representation of everything heavenly and heavenly worship, how it was done in heaven. And so the Lord has given them strict guidelines how to do it. And they didn't follow those guidelines, just to say in a nutshell, that's, again, it's almost a separate message in itself, that unauthorized fire is an interesting thing, isn't it? And uh, actually, I should say something about that as well. That there's an application for us in, in the New Testament time is that we need to be very careful what fire we get into church. There's a lot of songs about Lord send fire or something about fire. I think they're theologically a bit 
mm, shaky because fire often has to do with judgment. With judgment. Yeah. And I'm not singing those songs. All right? um, you know, it's like that. Some, some beautiful songs, but I have some words in there about Lord send fire. I actually keep my lips <laughs> sealed. So we, we don't do those songs, but I'm just saying it's, they're well meant, the songwriters probably meant well. It's just, I'm, all I'm saying is it's just fire all has to do with, with judgment. And um, don't pray that. And uh, also unauthorized fire has something to do of you cannot ascribe everything that moves and shakes and rattles and makes noise in a church is necessarily of the Holy Spirit. And that again, the beginning, the fear of the Lord is beginning the wisdom. We need wisdom and discernment because have you ever wondered how these magicians in Egypt could turn up blood and frogs? And my word, those who they call magicians is basically a cult in uh, the court of Pharaoh. They could make some of these things, not all of them, Later on they gave up and saying, this is God Almighty, this is the finger of God. But they could make quite some mis amazing miracles where we go, whoa, where the contemporary church would say, God is, God is moving, God is moving. Really? <laughs> Do your homework. Be a Berean. The Bereans, everything the apostles said to them, they're like, hold on a minute, Paul, Paulus, hold on. Going home, we're going to do our homework. You know what? Paul never rebuked him for that. Wow. Yeah. Go do your homework. And they studied, and they studied what the Apostle Paul and Apollos preached. And they're like, oh, yeah, here it is. And they came back the next day. So it's so important, and this is a little practical application to the unauthorized fire. And so the Lord was, what he did was, Showing himself holy when the tabernacle was introduced in the tabernacle worship. Why didn't he do that after? Because he's a merciful God. He was only setting an example. If he was continuing to do that, I would be terrible. I mean, think of Eli's sons. They didn't even allow the meat to be properly boiled. <laughs> they just put that pitchfork in it against the law, against the Levitical law, and ate it before the, their due time. And, you know, they were still alive and breathing. <laughs> the Lord was setting an example that He's a holy God, and the sons of Eli had the scriptures to say they couldn't do that. Remember the rich man saying to, to Abraham, Oh, just maybe send somebody from heaven, and then my brothers will listen. And Abraham said, Oh, no, they won't. They have the scriptures, and if they won't listen to the scriptures, they won't listen to anyone. Okay, Pastor, now this is all Old Testament stuff and, and God changed. Like we have between the book of Malachi and Matthew, God had 400 years reflection and he was thinking, hmm, maybe I was a little bit too harsh, I'm going to change. <laughs> no, absolutely not. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is still a holy God. He is the same God in the Old Testament. May I ask you a question? In the first book, in the book of Acts, the first church, guess what books they, they preached from? Old Testament. Old Testament. Yeah. There was no New Testament people. They were the New Testament. <laughs> they were the living New Testament, amen. <laughs> there was no New Testament. The, the apostles and the authors of the, the Gospels, they were concerned that the next generation wouldn't have, when the apostles getting older, they wouldn't have the living word right there. They said, and even Luke said it, I'm carefully going to record all this and write it down, basically. Yeah. And that's how the New Testament came about. But the more you read the Old Testament, the, more you the better you understand the New Testament. Pastor, I don't understand the book of Revelation. Read the Old Testament. The more you read it, and I know it's not an easy thing. Okay, you can you can skip Songs of Solomon most of the time. That's especially when you're single. Especially when you're single. <laughs> skip the Songs of Solomon. Then. But the more you understand the Old Testament the better you start to understand the New Testament. Yeah, but that's work. Exactly that is work. 
Did the Lord Jesus ever tell you that a red carpet is laid out for you? Yes, his blood that is shed for us. But in a sense, it says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. So it has something to do with working it out. It says also, regarding the gifting, the working of miracles. In other words, prayer, miracles, it is hard work. It doesn't always come easy. And that's why we need to go back always and, and do our homework. Okay, we're going to the New Testament now. And you're probably familiar with that. And again, it's an initiation that God is showing himself holy. We have two church members by the names of Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how would it be today? <laughs> yeah, anyway, just... Yeah. yeah. Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land and the Apostle Peter is basically saying, to, and he's led by the Holy Spirit, he's asking them a question. Mm -hmm. If a pastor would ask that question today, he'd probably be fired by the board, by the church board. But anyway, the Apostle Peter asked a question. Is this all the money you are laying at my feet for the land you sold? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, first the husband dies, <laughs> and then the wife comes in later and shows you the responsibility uh, a husband has for their whole household and then the wife comes in later and she also dies great church service people that's, that's the New Testament church and the apostle Peter clearly said you could have kept all the money for yourself but do not lie to the Holy yes. Spirit that's a could have kept it, could have given, and he could, he could have said to the Apostle Peter, this is 10% of my land sale. Fine. Don't lie. Do not lie to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't do that today. We don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we are lying. And what a pastor, are you trying to get the fear of God in me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do this morning. We can lie to the Holy Spirit by pretending to be somebody else we are not. Yes. And you can, unless I have, or Pastor Karen has a prophetic word or utterance or insight, you can fool us for two hours on Sunday or anybody thereof. Or you can fool any pastor because we see you on your Sunday best, I hope. <laughs> but you cannot lie to the Holy Spirit. And we lie, how do we lie to the Holy Spirit? By confessing that you believe in Jesus, but denying them by your actions. And I didn't come down in the last rain shower. I've been young once, so some people don't believe that. Yeah. I know as that on today's church culture, also on the Sunshine Coast, it is so common after the youth meeting to go clubbing. It is so common to sleep, common to sleep around. The Bible calls that fornication. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why pastors don't address this is because they don't want to lose anybody in their church, their youth group, or don't be fired by their board. Because pastor, the church stops growing, you're addressing issues you shouldn't address. We serve a holy God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, and the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh, or those who want to receive Him, the judgment and the accountability and the responsibility is higher than the Old Testament. Most contemporary Christians today think, that God was a harsh God in the Old Testament and we have the lenient God in the New Testament. No we are more accountable today. I mean, Noah, you know, the, the flood subsided. Noah just grew a bit of wine, uh, vine a little vineyard, he got drunk, you know, and things like that. And the Bible is honest about people's mistakes. And Aaron uh, turned and made a little golden calf and he was still walking around after that. Yeah. 
people, the New Testament requirements are higher than the Old Testament requirement. Why? Because God, and He's given us the power, He's given us the, the instruments to live a holy life. He's given us the heavenly armor, Ephesians 6. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's given us his, the abundance of His Word. In the Old Testament, the people had to travel for miles in the hot sun to get a word of the prophet. And I'm telling you, prophets of those days were no people pleasers. <laughs> What are you coming at my door for? <laughs> Some of the prophets. <laughs> yeah, they were very direct. One of the greatest last prophets, which is part of the Old and New Testament, preached an extremely secret, unsensitive message. And he was preaching that to believers, not to atheists. Repent. For the kingdom of yes. heaven is near. Yes. I would say today to the church and anybody on there hearing through the, through the camera, through the downloading on, on YouTube or whatever, um, and under my hearing this morning, this is the time for the churches yes. to yes. repent. Yes. Pastors again need to be John the Baptist preachers. Yes. Not walking around camels here as a letter belt necessarily, <laughs> but what they say again because the return of the Lord, which in this case, to me specifically, is the rapture, is imminent. doesn't mean we don't plan. I plan for the next century. I would love to see our children have grandchildren, etc., etc. They're all great plans. But the return of the Lord is imminent. Yeah. So to that, the message, of course, there's so many te topics we can preach on today, and we will as well. And many other aspects, and also in our midweek group. But one of the main messages that should come through today in the Sunday meetings in any church anywhere in the world is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It does say in the word of God that in the last days he will send a great delusion. Yeah. I almost, and this is just my personal interpretation, this is not doctrine, an absolute biblical doctrine, I almost start wondering if this whole way governments, the UN, who and all the other organizations are giving in to the pressure that a virus has 99% survival rate to the delusion. And it's definitely a delusion to, and yeah I know it's on camera, <laughs> But it's a delusion that can take away our freedom. And it starts too much looking like the 1930s. Where, and that's just an example where the Nazis came to the Jewish people and they said, we just need your names, that's all, we'll leave you alone. We just need your names and then the next step. We just need your address. We just need that. You just need to wear a yellow star. Next step, next step, next step. Till they end up in... Auschwitz. Now you say, Pastor, that might be an extreme example. No, I see the similarities of the things that are happening here. The thing was said, and freedom, having uh, Pastor Karen and myself having worked ourselves in the former Soviet Union and now in Eastern Europe, freedom is the most precious good you can get. And also one of the third, one other things that the dangers of the last days, it is not earthquakes, it's not pestilence, it's deception. not famine, though all these things are happening. Deception. It is deception. Yeah. People and governments, that's why I said the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is deception where we are shutting down countries mm. for a virus that has 99% survival rate. Right. Masks are a sign of submission yes. and bondage. And, bondage. Yes. and please, I am not a medical doctor, do your own research. If they actually really help, do your own research and come to your own conclusions. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we serve a holy God. A holy God. Mm. Basically, in conclusion this morning, 
Wow, I managed to stick roughly about a half hour. Well done, Pastor. <laughs> and it's fully realizing that there are no merit points whatsoever in ourselves. That's also part of the fear of God. Sometimes we can start thinking of ourselves like, oh, you know, I've accomplished something and not too bad. And let's give you that example. From, <laughs> Pastor, you said to be a closing. Okay, one more thing. <laughs> The example of Pastor of uh, Apostle Paul. When he started his ministry, he said, I am the least of the apostles. Went well, a little bit further uh, in his ministry, he said, I am the least of all the saints. At the end of his ministry, he said, I am the greatest of all sinners. That is progress. <laughs> the more we walk closer to Christ, it, uh, when I was uh, a young pastor just a few years ago, and as praise God, these messages are never recorded, I thought, hmm, I'm doing pretty good. I realized more and more there is absolutely, outside the Holy Spirit, of course, and the blood of Jesus, there is absolutely nothing good in me. And don't say amen, please. <laughs> no, I mean that. From There is no good in us. And that is another aspect of the fear of God, that whatever you do, you evangelize, share the gospel with other people, work with unbelievers, which is about 80% of my time of the week, Whatever you do, you realize in yourself that there is nothing good in you. Everything and everything is because hit the cross, the blood of Jesus. And so when you share the gospel with people, you're coming from a position not of judgment, but realizing and asking the question yourself, where would I be if I wouldn't believe her? I would do the exact same thing what they are doing, or probably worse. Yeah. Yeah. It is only Christ living in me, and the Holy Spirit living in me, and then the fear of God, like I said, the love of God brings us to repentance, but the fear of God keeps me on the straight and narrow. Amen. I actually can't go to close, but I just want to read this. <laughs> uh, where is it to see if I can quickly find it? It's not on the screen, but I'll read it in, in closing. Oh, in Exodus 19, verse 10 to 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon the Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. So he's very gracious to the ladies, gave them three days to get ready. No, it is... Because he wanted to be sure that the people were ready on the third day. But God, one day is a thousand years. We're in the third millennium. I know, only, only Father God knows the day. But we're living, we're living in the third millennium, the third day. We need to prepare ourselves for the Lord to come back. And basically in conclusion, in Exodus 2020, 20, and Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. Of course, there's two different root words used here for the fear. So do not be afraid or terrified of this world and the things around us, but he does say the Lord has come to test you, yeah, and prepare you, so you will fear him. What did Moses say to Pharaoh? Let my people go so they can go to the promised land. No, he didn't say that. Let my people go so they may worship me. Yeah. God spends more time in the preparation the than in the well. actual ministry. There is so much effort from the Holy Spirit and the Lord God in preparation. So if you're asking the Lord today, where's my time? Where's my ministry? It is all in the preparation. John the Baptist prepared his whole life and had six months ministry and was beheaded. But he's the greatest of all prophets. What the Lord was doing in the desert 
He was not so much concerned with the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. He was just going. He said he was going to test them in the desert to prepare them for the promised land. And so much of the focus today and preaching today is on the promised land and on the streets of gold. Do you realize you're here on earth to be prepared for something greater? Even if it's not for an earthly ministry, you are in your lifetime being prepared. We are in the desert, so to speak, symbolically speaking, being prepared for a much greater purpose that is reigning and ruling with Him. A good place to say Amen. I am going to close. A good place to say Amen because all of that was in the desert is to prepare His people. And the people started grumbling and complaining and acting in unbelief. Doesn't that describe sometimes ourselves and the church? Praise God, His mercy is withholding the fire that happened to the sons of Aaron and Ananias and Sapphira. It is His mercy we're breathing and standing here. If we can, let us stand to our feet. Thank you, Father God that we can be here in this humble gathering. What I wanted to get across this morning, that there is nothing good in me outside Jesus Christ or in us. It is only your blood. It is only the cross. It is only your Holy Spirit willing to dwell in sinful flesh. But through that, Lord, we, through the fear of the Lord and through the knowledge of the Scriptures, we, that is the beginning of wisdom. Help us, Lord, to, to grow in, in wisdom and in discernment and regarding the things that are happening in our nation and in other nations. Give governments wisdom because they're obviously acting in fear, not based on proper scientific facts. Pray, Father God, for salvation of many in our family, in our circles, in our nation. We're crying out for salvation of people. We're crying out for salvation of our souls. Yeah. As Charles Spurgeon said, first I will be surprised who is not in heaven. Then I'll be surprised who is in heaven. And then I'm surprised that I am in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true, Lord. The fear of God will keep us on the straight and narrow. Keep us on the straight and narrow. Keep our bodies pure. I pray yeah. for the young people here in this church and other churches that they will repent of sleeping together. Yeah. That they will yeah. repent and turn on their ways yes. and turn to a holy God yes. and not to false Jesus in the smoke, in the lights, in the noise, but the true Jesus Christ who saved and redeemed us in Jesus' name. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you this week and strengthen us because we live in hard times, but we will overcome in Jesus' name. If you have a prayer request this morning,